As we've been reporting, events are being held in Rwanda to mark the 30th anniversary of the genocide. Olushala John Jacobs examines a period when the world came face to face with the horrors of Mondays. I'm joined on the line from Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, by someone who survived the genocide. Janvier Mucho is the CEO of Empowering Dreams Foundation. Janvier, thank you for being with us on Arise Primetime. Can you hear me, Jean Vier? Can you hear me? Okay, looks like we are experiencing technical. Okay. We are experiencing technical difficulties there. Um, we'll be back shortly. Please stay with us. Well, unfortunately, we were unable to get back Janvier Mucho. We'll try later in the program. But for now, I'm being joined in the studio, studio by the Rwandan High Commissioner to Nigeria, Ambassador Christoph Bazivamu. Ambassador, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so it's <coughs> the 30th anniversary of the genocide. And since that incident, very unfortunate incident, your country has achieved a lot of milestones, hasn't it? Uh, let me say first that uh, for commemoration, being of ATF or others, uh, of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda in 1994, uh, is to remember uh, over one million pe people one million Tutsi who have been lost during that period. So it is not only to remember them, it's also to think about do we stay where we have seen the country in that period or we keep moving forward in the rebuilding of the country. And what we have been trying in the last 30 years, was actually, first of all, to ensure security for all Rwandans, to ensure we do healing of people and reconciliation, and moving forward to try to bring back institutions and put in place legal framework to ensure actually we will build the country in a way that we can run it moving together with everyone, avoiding to leave anyone behind. Right. Um, obviously, a lot has happened since then. And as you have mentioned, you're still in the process of rebuilding and you have done a lot of that. Can you share with us the processes that led to where we are today, how you were able to heal the country and, and give us what it is today? So uh, healing and reconciliation was very key to come up later on with, again, unity of Rwandans. Because we always think that if you are not united, it is difficult actually to progress to develop, and this was key in our process. Unity of Rwandans, reconciliation among themselves, and trying to bring back actually justice. And here we're insisting on uh, justice for reconciliation, not justice in a classic way, to ensure we build or rebuild our economy and we thought it is important actually to count on our own resources because counting from outside, we have seen it was not working. And we have actually uh, considered that the most important resource of a country is its population. And here, building capacity of the population through education, ensuring adequate health for everyone, 
and uh, uh, economically to also count on uh, what we have in our uh, country. These were actually things which were important to bring back and this has been helpful. Especially yeah. counting on building the capacity of the population because we say as Rwandans, if we are together, we can and we have shown it is possible. You, you touch on a, a very important point, justice. Without justice, um, a society cannot be built. We understand that Rwanda incorporated some traditional African legal systems. Can you share with us or walk us through that and how that is being used in the interest of the Rwandese people? So let's say not only in the justice, but uh, in whichever you want to achieve in a sustainable way, uh, looking back in your tradition and finding which is the unifying factors which has helped our societies to build and to move forward is very important. So for the case of Rwanda, we have found in our tradition what we call traditional courts, which are gachacha, and these are community-based courts, which emphasize actually telling the truth, discussing and uh, building together a common understanding for a solution to be adopted by everyone. And this has brought actually our people together to discuss through the church, to find the right punishment for who have committed the genocide, and again to try to reconcile people who are victims and people who have been uh, actually uh, uh, killers to try to, because the country is one, we have to live together, we have to find a way of living together. So reconciliation was very key, even if it is hard, but we have tried. And these traditional courts, called the Chacha, community-based courts, have helped a lot in that process. He said that that reconciliation was hard. You know, truth and reconciliation, South Africa also had it, you know, at the end of apartheid. How hard was it? Because uh, we believe that other African countries can learn from Rwanda. Yeah. <coughs> what specifically e did you do? Everyone should understand that actually sitting together, uh, victims and uh, uh, perpetrators is not an easy thing. It is not an easy task. But everyone wanted also to know why this has happened. Among people have been living together for a long time. And we have discovered, which is one, that actually colonialism has played a big role. Issue of poverty, the element of bad politics, bad governance, and the involving of the government can only be uh, one of the strong reasons a genocide, a genocide can happen and be conducted. So this arm of the government was also uh, uh, identified, and people were understanding that there are many causes, root causes of this to happen. And individual cases were to be punished according to what they have done, but the system itself has to re re be reviewed so that we can move forward together. And this sitting together victims and uh, uh, per per perpetrators, perpetrators and trying to find out how, because we have to be together, what is to be done on one side, what to be done on the other side, so that people can keep on together. This has actually helped the community to be together. Of course, punishing those who were actually, uh, who have committed the genocide, and also understanding who, because it was an issue of a society to identify who exactly has committed what. And then to see you can move with for remaining part of the population because you cannot criminalize everyone. In terms of healing, is Rwanda completely there? Because we're human beings and there is always the potential to relapse. What do you so think? So we do a uh, kind of evaluation every year. We bring people together, we analyze how the society, the society is moving, the community are living together. And we have found so far that uh, when it comes to reconciliation, we are at 94% uh, of this process. 
but it is an ongoing process. You cannot say we stop because it is needed over time. But on the back of these successes, some would say there has been a certain loss of freedom or a bit of fear within Rwanda. Um, how would you respond to that? This is uh, something you have to witness actually when you are in Rwanda. People are happy with uh, what uh, we have achieved. People are happy with which kind of governance we are facing. We are contributing because even in uh, this uh, process of uh, governance, we had to involve the population, not to have only the administration, but to go up to the family levels and to involve everyone in this process of administration. And we have seen that actually in the past we are leaving behind women and we have said so they are more than 50 percent of the population if you leave them behind you cannot move forward you do maybe one step and you come back one step again so involving women has played also a big role not only in the social justice but also in the socio-economic development of our country. And when you also put on the table capacity building and building, uh, bringing women in the education process and ensuring that all children, being ladies or boys, are enrolled in primary, secondary, and open for university for everyone, this capacity building, education, has also played a role, especially bringing on the table women in all levels of uh, administration and in all angle of the government. And here I will say maybe that Rwanda has 61% now. Yes, I was coming to that. Yeah. Um, Rwanda has a 61.25% of women in parliament. It's the highest across Africa. Um, I have a list of so many countries here. Nigeria is not even on the list of the first 13. So from your experience, you are in government. What is unique about women and administration and leadership and governance? What, what do they bring? Mm -hmm. Wisdom. Let's say that women have this kind of tolerance first. They, have more pas they, are, they are more patient than, than men and they are listeners and whenever they are committed count on them and this we have seen and also we say wherever you are uh, capacitating a woman then you are capacitating the whole family and later on the whole community and the country and this involvement of women because we say uh, wherever we are uh, uh, having levels of administration uh, in the government, at least 30 percent should be women, wherever. And then in the cabinet, we have also, for the time being, it is uh, again more than 50 percent of the cabinet being women. And this is also part of our constitution, because the constitution, which is uh, own grown, also uh, homegrown uh, constitution, we have been moving around the world to analyze different uh, approaches uh, when it comes to government and we have actually developed a context-based constitution for Rwandans and this has been helping a lot because it brings in this element of unity and reconciliation it brings in participation or political parties where we have also a forum of political parties who come together whenever being in government or not in government, but they have forum where they meet and debate on the um, important uh, issues of uh, the country. You have also the, 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 uh, the in the constitution that a president who do win elections cannot have more than 50% uh, in the cabinet, meaning ministers, coming from his own party. And in the parliament, you, he is also not allowed to get a speaker from his own party. It means you share. And this kind of 
power sharing has also been something which is positive for our development. Now that you talked about power sharing, um, a very important point. Um, President Kagame has been president since the end of the genocide. He was instrumental to building a new Rwanda. Obviously, he didn't do it alone. He had help from other Rwandese as well, but he provided leadership. He has made known his interest to run again this year. Is he going to be a life president? Let's say he's exceptional as a president. He's a good leader and he has shown actually high level of leadership. And Rwandans, Rwandans can see it. If this has been seen outside the country, so why Rwandans should not see, uh, should not be able to see it? And normally we also say that uh, leaders who are exceptional, like him, you have them maybe in, uh, you have one in uh, 100 years. So if you have a chance to have this kind of person, and then the person is still capable, strong enough to lead, why would you change? But and the you, will, but this is the will of a population. Yeah, but it, would you call that a democracy, though? Democracy is about the will of the population. Right. If they go to elections and you have competing candidates and there is one winner, so why don't you qualify it as democracy? But it's, it's, no, it's not an environment that it's easy for opposition politicians to operate yeah. out but, of fear. But you have more than 80 party, political parties in Rwanda and uh, uh, they, they are open actually when it comes to elections. They are open for competition. The president do not, do not, does not run alone. But we say also who is actually the right person to choose? Some people from outside or Rwandans? If Rwandans are happy with the president, I think it is right to consider that. Their choice is valid. And if they choose to uh, elect him in the coming elections, I think it is also right to consider that the will has won. And uh, to get him will be also a good thing, not only for Rwanda, but for all Africa, because we have seen what he has been doing. And we normally say, if you have a, a, a good president, don't trust him to test a new one. The one you know is better than actually experience a new one you don't know. So we, we, this is the, the, the thinking and the approach of our uh, citizen, approach of Rwandan to say we have been together with him. We have seen what he has been uh, achieving, what he has helped the country to achieve. We, are, we, we consider where we are now. We are happy if we say we want to continue with him. We are also right as Rwandans and nobody else is right to say no. Ambassador Bazivamu, thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.